Don't tell me what's fair, right? I mean, you know, it just really annoys me when anybody on the other side says, this is fair, right? Because the problem with that is fairness is a matter of perspective. Hello, and welcome to See You in Court, the podcast that informs you about the Georgia civil justice system, what it means to you, and how it protects individual rights. This podcast is a collaboration between the Georgia Civil Justice Foundation and the Georgia Institute of Technology. Your hosts are Robin Fraser clark and Lester Tate, who are both past presidents of the State Bar of Georgia and currently serve on the board of directors of the Georgia Civil Justice Foundation. And now this episode of See You in Court. Good morning, friends and lovers of the law, and welcome to See You in Court. I am Robin Fraser Clark, and with me, as usual, is my co-host Lester Tate. Good morning, Good morning. Lester. Good morning, Robin. It's a it's a great day when you love the law, and uh, we had <laughs> great a day for justice. We had a little fellowship at the lawyers' club last night. And, we did. Uh, I, I enjoyed having dinner with you last night, and I was a little just a just a tad disappointed that Thomas Worthy, our speaker, who's the chairman of the board of MARTA, didn't mention the fact that he was once our state bar lobbyist, but, you know, I got over it. It's all right. I, I, I sent him a text afterwards asking him when Marta was coming to Cartersville, Georgia. You know, so, <laughs> yes. um, but uh, but, you know, today, Robin, is the beginning of March Madness. Oh, you know, yeah. Noon today, about the time we get through with this podcast, the you know, all of the Cinderella's will be trying to put their foot into a glass slipper and uh, see if they can uh, move forward uh, through the big dance. And uh, I think it's especially appropriate that today uh, we're instead of March Madness, we're having Murdoch trial madness uh, here on the See You in Court podcast, because uh, I've seen all of these cartoons and uh, uh, memes and, and whatnot that show uh People in law offices can actually go back to work now that the Murdoch trial is over because everybody was watching it uh, as it was going on. And uh, and particularly in South Carolina, and I, I think in Georgia, too. Oh, but today we are delighted. I had a friend of mine who's a lawyer in, in Southern California. She's an employment lawyer. Uh, and, you know, they were having horrible weather during that time. And she right. said, look. I'm just I'm reined in, so I'm watching the Murdoch trial, and she was texting me every day. What do you think? What do you think? Oh my gosh, okay, <laughs> it's all the way out in California. Yeah, well, and to 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 help us, uh, you know, there there are podcasts that are just devoted to the okay. Murdoch trial. So we felt like we had to get in the competition too. You know, there are a bunch of documentaries. You know, Netflix has one, HBO has one. So we had to have a, 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 a Murdoch trial expert. And we've got my friend uh, Bill Nettles from South Carolina uh, with us today. Good morning, Bill. How are you? I'm doing great, Lester. How about you? Hi, Robin, I see you. Hey, Bill. Welcome to the show. Thanks for being with us today. Thank you yeah. for having me. So I'm going to give Bill's uh, little bio here. And uh, I, I, I may enhance it or, or, or whatnot as we go through. But uh, Bill Nettles was the United States attorney for uh, the District of South Carolina. They've only got one district uh, over there. We got three here in Georgia. But uh, Bill graduated from the Citadel. Uh, I told him the other day I thought he was one of the more unlikely Citadel graduates, you know, that I knew. Thank you. I take that as a compliment. <laughs> he has his law degree from the Widener University School of Law, where he was on law review. He was a member of the Moot Court Honor Society. After graduating, he began a career that has taken him to every corner of the legal system, literally. Uh, Bill was a career public defender in Columbia, South Carolina, providing uh, criminal defense to indigent defendants who could not afford lawyers. And during that time, he ensured that the legal system would not leave the economically disadvantaged behind. From 1997 to 2005, he was in private practice as a sole practitioner, continued to do criminal defense work, and became one of the region's most well-respected white-collar uh, criminal lawyers. He also represented clients accused of drug crimes, handled several court-appointed uh, capital cases, twice tried cases that were argued before the United States Supreme Court. 
uh, and worked in the area of medical malpractice and other torts from 2005 to 2010. He worked at Sanders and Nettles. Uh, in 2010, he was appointed U.S. Attorney for the District of South Carolina by President Obama and was sworn into that office on May 3rd, 2010. As U.S. Attorney, he dramatically overhauled the office to focus on public corruption, fraud, and white-collar crime, while also greatly increasing resources for the extraordinarily important false claim and whistleblower division. Under Bill's leadership, the U.S. Attorney's Office made white-collar crime and public corruption the highest priority of the criminal division's efforts. He also earned national praise for innovative and intelligent uh, approach to uh, drug crimes. He's now back in private practice with his own firm, Bill Nettles, attorney at law in Columbia, South Carolina. Let's give it up for Bill Nettles. Wow. I'm really glad you didn't ask me to write that. It wouldn't have been nearly as good. <laughs> I mean, really, I, like, I want to meet that dude. Well, I, I you know, I would say, uh, Bill, that I doubt there have been many United States attorneys uh, that have tried capital cases uh, before as a defense attorney. Well, as a defense lawyer, you're right. Yeah, there's a fair number of them that are prosecuted. Yeah, it was. It, I had a unique perspective. I do perspectives, and uh, and that's one of the reasons that we're glad uh, glad to to uh, have you today. And uh, I'll start the cross examination here by uh, getting you. To, you know, we're going to talk about the Murdoch trial because now, and as I think a lot of our listeners may know, uh, uh, you and Robin certainly know. You know, I, I went to law school in South Carolina, but never, uh, never took the South Carolina bar. I didn't fail it. I just never took it. I came and I, I was only first in my class in one thing, and I was the first person to become a lawyer because I took the Georgia bar, and you could take it before you graduated, and the South Carolina bar, you had to have graduated before you could take it. So I I, I scored that single first, but I know a lot of lawyers in South Carolina, and they're all experts in the Mur Murdoch trial now. You know, I've seen all, all of you on television, you know, it's renewed old acquaintances, people I hadn't seen in 20 years, they're, oh, there they are on CNN, you know? So well, I gotta tell you, I mean, I will I would like to make this disclaimer, okay? I have consumed the minimum daily allowance to be a functioning adult in South Carolina of the Murdoch trial. Um, I mean, it it is, you know, that's a rabbit hole you could uh go down. And I mean, there are still some people that you know, we're still looking for. They went down that rabbit hole and, uh, or have not come back <laughs> yet. But it, it's, yeah, it's been a, um, I mean, I don't think there's been uh, anything folks talked about in South Carolina like this since Hurricane Hugo, frankly. I mean, you know, yeah. It's, it's been a while. So let's start out with laying a little groundwork here. Why, why did you become a lawyer? Did you have any mentors or anybody that steered you into the profession? It's kind of a long story. So uh, I'll be brief. I was in a horrible car wreck. And um, I graduated from Citadel. I was racing sailboats. I was, you know, just kind of, I mean, I had a fairly good gig going and I was in this horrible car wreck. I almost died. And I thought I kind of wanted to do something a little bit more substantive. And so I started, I volunteered teaching reading in the prisons, in the jail. Um, um, and I met this guy that I had been teaching and, you know, like I went to go see him, I see him a couple of weeks in a row and he's like, Oh, I'm good. I'm not going to be here next week. And he's like, um, I'm like, well, I didn't understand anything about process. And he's like, I got this amazing public defender and she got me this, you know, she got my case worked out or whatever. I can't remember what it got dismissed or whatever. I've never even heard of a public defender in college. Okay. So I did not have much of a exposure to the legal community, but I just thought, man, that sounds like a really cool job. And so I, you know, I went to law school because I really wanted to be a public defender. And um, I had a less than stellar, uh, uh, scholastic career undergrad, um, but I was able to get into Widener University Law School in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Um, 
it was their first year. <laughs> and so when I, when I went to, when I was started law school, it wasn't even accredited. Like they didn't even have books in the library yet. And, um, you know, I, I got out and I clerked for a law firm up there. And it was like a really cool plaintiff's firm. Um, and they offered me a job, but I just, I really wanted to be a public defender. So I, took, I asked them if, they, if I could just come down here, be a public defender for a couple of years and go back up north. And, and they were very amenable to that. And I came down as a public defender. I was a public defender for three years. And then um, I just I stayed. And so, I mean, I will just tell you that, I mean, that's not a particularly inspiring story I recognize. But I mean, I will just tell you that I, I just, I love being a lawyer. I, you know, most of my friends are lawyers. Um, I think it's a really cool job. And, you know, I, I, I enjoy doing it. I mean, I really do. It's a great job. Hey, I, I, cool people. I agree. I, mean, I would have never gotten to meet Lester Tate had I not been a lawyer. There you just go. Think how, much, think how much less rich my life would be had I not gotten the opportunity to. Lester and I are wrapping up a case that we've been involved with for about two years now, a criminal case down in South Georgia. I've gotten to meet some great lawyers in Georgia, and I've really enjoyed it. So, do yeah, you like would, prosecuting or defending better, Bill? You know, I mean, I mean, I think, I, you know, when I. When I got the job as United States attorney, I was sort of like the dog to call it in the car, you know, um, and I really uh, grew into the job, I think, sort of emotionally. Um, I think that just my nature, uh, just the way I'm wired, I'm probably a little bit more well suited to be a criminal defense, to be a defense lawyer. But I will tell you that I um, being United States attorney, and I'm not saying this just for any reason other than it's just the truth. I mean, I think both of them are very noble jobs. And um, uh, I really do think that, you know, when done right, you know, as a prosecutor, I mean, the struggle as a prosecutor is the internal struggle to keep the power in check, right? And not let all that go to your head. Because the one thing I realized about being a prosecutor was just how intoxicating power can be. Um, and, you know, as a criminal defense lawyer, you know, uh, I've, I've had, you can talk to my mom about it. I've always had a certain defiant streak, which is um, maybe a little bit of a difficult child, maybe. But I mean, I think it made me a fairly successful criminal defense lawyer. So I really enjoyed them both. And I have friends on both sides of it. And I mean, until I was a, until I got to be a United States attorney, I don't think I fully appreciated, you know, just how good how much good you could do as a prosecutor as well. So I kind of like them both, uh, but I think that, you know, I think that I spent more time as a criminal defense lawyer and I think I'm a little bit more. Uh, Temperamentally wired. suited to do that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I Were know. Did you ever prosecute, Lester? Did you ever prosecute? No, uh, that's, well, yes. In the city, the city court of Adairsville, one night a month, I put jaywalkers, speeders, uh, and folks like that at the at the edge of justice. Uh, but uh, other other than not, I have not. Uh, I, I uh, <clears throat> you know, I, I I was in the mix to be a U.S. attorney one time, but I didn't get picked like you did, Bill. So you know, it's a different thing. Yeah. Some people say that was an anomaly that I got it. I mean, I was a, I was not the, I was not the, the one that folks saw on the horizon for a while. Let's put it that way. Uh, Bill, I was going to say that I, I think things have changed with folks wanting to go to law school nowadays. But back when we all started out in law school, you may have been the only person to say they wanted to go to law school to be a public defender. I went to Emory Law School, and I'm pretty sure no one went there to to be a public defender. Well, I, I mean, I'll just tell you this. I mean, I tell folks that are um, to talk about, you know, I mean, occasionally somebody will come talk to me about wanting to be a lawyer. And I just tell them, I say, you know, look, man, if you're going to law school to make money, you'll probably make money. You'll probably make a good living. But, but if, like, the only reason you're doing it is to make money, you're going to be miserable. I mean, I'm just, you know, just miserable, right? And, but you know what? But you, I mean, look, I've been miserable poor and I've been miserable not poor. And, you know, the upside is it's better to be miserable with money than miserable without money. But, um, but you know, I mean, I think the people that are happiest as lawyers are people who just like being lawyers, you know, and you like, you know, you like, I mean, I think it's, 
I mean, I think that the 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 change that lawyers have brought about in this country is, you know, it's staggering. You know, it's staggering. And and you know, if you just enjoy helping people, like, I mean, I'd like to have been a doctor, I guess, but I'm not near smart enough to do that. But but I mean, I think it is really great to have a job where you can both make money and then, you know. Every now and then you can say, I'm going to do that case, not not for the money, but just because it's something I believe in or I believe in that person or I believe in that cause or I believe they've been wronged and I want to make it better. And um, I so, yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I, I, think, often, I, I think if more people went to law school to help people, things would be better. I often talk about being a lawyer and how the power to. Uh, subpoena information, subpoena witnesses gives us a special right and a special duty in our society and to take those cases because no no one off the street can do that. But we we can. We have that certain ability and power as lawyers and to, to use it in the right way. I mean, if you look at it, I mean, you know, I mean, we could pick issues on either side, you know, but I mean, you know, whether it's civil rights or, you know, a woman's right to choose or voting rights or, you know, like the really big issues that are, are most of the big issues that have come along in my life have been largely, you know, because a lawyer took initiative or, you know, and so, I mean, it's, it's, I love it. And I, I, I really do love being a lawyer. I mean, I've already said that once. I'll say it again. Yeah. It's just, it's just a cool job. And it took me a long time to find something that I was like, halfway decent at and so you know yeah. well i want to ask you bill i know now you do something called key tam litigation i've, I've always thought latin uh key tam was latin for caught cheating you know that's uh, actually pretty funny lester and and i'm gonna use that and i'm gonna try to remember to footnote you but I, but 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 don't hold me to doing it consistently okay but that's actually i'm gonna work that into my little skit i like that a lot so uh, uh, t tell us about the people, uh, about how you, that's a big part of your practice now, as I understand right. it. And, right. uh, and, and uh, tell folks, tell, tell our listeners about that, if you would. Yeah. I mean, I sort of, I mean, that's just another thing that I've just, I've just had a really good life. Right. And I just sort of fell into it. Right. And basically what happened was, you know, I got to be U.S. attorney and then I realized that a function of, big part of being the United States attorney was put people in jail, which is just something I just never enjoyed, you know? And frankly, I think that, I mean, you know, I mean, prosecutors will say that, you know, but I think that a really good prosecutor should be someone that genuinely does not enjoy putting people in jail, right? Because I think, you know, that's, that's, that's a healthy check on that power, right? But I just genuinely didn't, I mean, you have to do it. I recognize it, you know, um, but, um, I looked around the office and there were these two really great lawyers up on the floor above us that were doing this stuff called false claim. And it was two women and they were, to my mind, they were the two best lawyers in the office. And, and I just kind of started, you know, thinking about this and, 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 you know, and it, I found it really exciting. The, the public private partnership, I've always been very, I think in business and just about any field, a public private partnership is a really good deal. And so I realized this whole notion that, you know, false claims or whistleblower or key cam or whatever you want to call it was, you know, was a really, it was interesting because you got people in private practice bringing the case to the government, the government deciding whether they wanted to go forward or not. And then even if the government didn't want to go forward, then you know the, the the people, the private lawyers could go forward in the name of the king, which is what key tam really means, right? In the name of the king. But I like call it cheating better. But at any rate, and so um I just became fascinated with it. Um and we did that really big, like if you remember during the mortgage loan crisis, there was that big case, the robo signing case. Um, and we did that case. I mean, South Carolina did it, it kind of put us on the map. And so I then set about expanding that unit from two lawyers to seven um, and took it from the bottom, you know, quarter of the country to one of the top five districts, not even the top quarter, but like the top 
you know, 5% of the districts in terms of recovery. And, you know, then we were, then we started uh, looping in a piece where every case that came in that, that we did a relator interview with, I had somebody from the white collar sitting in. So the, 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 the false claims cases, you know, not only were, you know, uh, fighting fraud, but it was also uh, a good um, uh, 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 source of good, solid white collar work to the white collar division, which I was building as well. So they worked together really well. Uh, you know, I mean, our budget at the United States Attorney's Office when I was there was about $9 million a year for the whole state. And we, after the first year I was there, we really ramped this up. I mean, the office, the District of South Carolina, may put more money into Treasury than it took out by like multiples of a lot. OK, I mean, there were years regularly when we were bringing in in excess of one hundred million dollars a year. Now, that's not that's not those that's not those criminal fines that everybody talks about. Right. Good. Which never get paid. I mean, this is money that goes into the bank. You know, the Treasury. gets this guy. And it, I found it a really exciting, fun, cool, rewarding thing to do. I mean, look, stealing from the government, you know, is it's just, you know, it makes me crazy <laughs> so, because I mean, you know, it's like a really good gig, right? If you're like a doctor or something like that, I mean, how great would it be to be, you know, like all you had, you didn't have to worry about like clients would come to you and all you got to do is play by the rules, man. All you got to do is just do billing, you know, and if you don't want to do billing by the rules, okay, by Medicare, Medicaid rules, don't take Medicare, Medicaid, right? But you can't have it both ways or defense contractors. We had a lot of defense fraud in South Carolina because we got a you know, very significant. So anyway, I enjoyed it. In case you can't tell, I enjoy talking about it, but I'll stop right there. But um, I enjoy it. I really do enjoy doing it. And, we, and it's been very, you know, we, we've got a really vibrant false claims practice now. And we've got cases all over the country and, and we're really enjoying doing that. And, and your rest of your practice is uh, criminal defense, Personal injury, criminal. just everything, or is it just criminal? Yeah, we do a little bit of I mean, look, I, I don't, um, we don't, um, look, there are a lot of really, really, really capable people that are like fighting in the sandbox for personal injury cases. I mean, we do a really good job on personal injury cases that come to us, but I mean, I'm not, we're not, you know, really in, I mean, that's a, that's a, just the marketing on that personal injury cases in uh, cases is a, that's a tough game. So yeah. we do a good job. We do a really, really good job on the few personal injury cases we get. Um, but it's not something that we're, you know, marketing on. I mean, the vast majority of my focus in terms of marketing is either white collar or, or um key dam whistleblower cases. You've spent your entire law practice legal career in South Carolina. And for outsiders looking in, people might think that South Carolina law is unique, that it's a different a different thing than the rest of law in the rest of the United States. I think I told you when I was in law school, I had the honor of um, clerking for a law firm in Charleston, South Carolina, both summers of, of law school. And even for a young law student, I kind of recognized back then this this is different than the way law is in Atlanta, Georgia. Um Tell us a little bit about that. Do you agree with that, that it's unique in South Carolina or is that just a, well, a rumor? Yeah, right. Well, I mean, I, look, I don't know. Right. It's the only place I've ever really practiced. I mean, I practiced in Pennsylvania as a law clerk for for a little bit, you know, um, and even there, that was a law firm that was in a fairly small town in South Carolina, I mean, in Pennsylvania. So, I mean, this is the only world I know. I mean, but I do know this. All right. That. um you know, I hear that from other people. Um, I mean, I think, you know, South Carolina is still, I mean, look, y'all have got Atlanta. I mean, I don't know what the population of Atlanta is, but it's probably, you know, a fairly significant portion of the whole state of South Carolina, right? So, you know, y'all have got a major international city and, you know, we don't, right? And so, you know, we've got Charleston, we've got Greenville, we've got Columbia, Um but none of those are anything like Charlotte or or Greenville or or even you know Raleigh for that matter you know but um, so I mean I think South Carolina is still largely a you know it's it's a lot 
a lot of it's still very, very rural. Not that y'all don't have a lot of rural areas in Georgia, but you know, you, you you've also got something that all sets out, which is a, I mean, it's a I mean, it's an international city, Atlanta. Um, and so I mean, I think that I did. I don't really have a frame of reference on that, although if I was forced to talk about it, I would probably think that it's probably not dissimilar to a lot of states that, you know, that are the population is similar to South Carolina. Well, one of the things that hit me, and like I said, I only spent, you know, my law school years there, didn't take the bar, but with so many people. And and when you and I met, you and I, you know, and that was one of the questions. I think Robin had something about us meeting. You know, we didn't meet in law school. You know, we've met, you know, uh, fairly recently, but we know a lot of the <laughs> same folks, right. even though I only spent, you know, my law school years over there. And uh, one of the things that always, you know, about South Carolina, I mean, like the number of people that I could look back on that, you know, had, uh, you know, been elected to public office or been on the bench or, uh, you know, I clerked for uh, Richard Gurgle, who was a 34 year old sole practitioner. You know, now he's the. Uh, you know, U.S. District Court judge, you know, in Charleston. So uh, I, I've always felt like one of the things about South Carolina that was different. I mean, Robin and I know a lawyer in just about every little nook and cranny uh, of, of Georgia. Of Georgia. Right. Uh, my office has accused, you know, they're like they, they, they'll name a city and say, do you know a lawyer there? And I usually do. But in South Carolina, you don't just know a name. It's like, you know, you know them. And to me, and, and I'm going to move on to our Murdoch trial uh, thing uh, for a minute. But to me, that was one of the things that sort of captured South Carolina attention so quickly on it. And and maybe the fact that you got the whole state going in the same direction, you know, sort of infected the rest of us with Murdoch madness there. Right, right. Well, I mean, I do think that one thing before we move on to that, but to address the issue that you're kind of talking about, I mean, like, I didn't go to the University of South Carolina, but that's sort of an anomaly, right? And until probably 10 years ago, there was only one law school in South Carolina, right? So, I mean, I do think that that, you know, probably fostered an environment of, you know, where, you know, depending on how you look at it, right? You could call it collegiality, you call it incest, I don't know, you know, depending on which side of the, you know, depends on which side of the fence you're on on that. But I mean, you know, until fairly recently, there was, I mean, and forever in a day, there was only one law school in South Carolina. And, you know, now, of course, they've got law school down in Charleston, but, um, which I think is good. You know, I mean, I think, I think it's good. I mean, I think, I mean, I kind of believe that, you know, I mean, I think, I believe that, you know, there needs to be some qualifications and all, but I think the market does a pretty good job of sort of sorting out, you know, and, and you know, I, I would hate to think that, you know, that people don't get, I mean, look, I didn't know I was going to go to law school or even want to go to law, till, law school until I was way out of college, right? And when I was at the Citadel, like, all I wanted to do was get out. I wanted like a 2-0 and go. That's all I wanted was out, okay? And so, I mean, you know, had it not been for a startup law school down the road, I would have never gotten to be a lawyer, right? Um, because, you know, now, by the same time, I mean, people should be rewarded that are like work hard all through high school. They want to be a lawyer. They go to college to be a lawyer. You know, they go to law school right out of college. But that's not the only path to get there. And so I really do think it's good to have, you know, a lot of accessibility to education. I think education is good. Um, and so I'm kind of a fan of there being more than one. So there, I, I, I want to start the other night uh, the, when the Murdoch trial, you know, was about to reach a verdict. Uh, you and I were uh, <clears throat> had texted and then then talked uh, a little bit. And uh, one of the things that we talked about, and by the way, I'm not giving anybody any background on the Murdoch trial. You know, if you don't know what we're talking no, about right now. Yeah, you know what? Can, can you believe this? There, <laughs> you know, there were five people, five people who swore on a Bible that they had in Collin County had never heard of the Murdoch trial. <laughs> Right. It's hard to believe. Right. Right. Hard to believe. But, but one of the things we were talking about is, you know, every time that a major network goes in and you talk about these 
uh, kings of the legal field in South Carolina that go back this prominent legal family uh, throughout the uh, throughout the state. And I think I had a little bit uh, different take on that than than what was being broadcast. And you and I were talking about it. And and I didn't really have the you know, I didn't live there, didn't know every everybody as well, only went to law school there. But uh, I think you should. Let me tell you something, Lester. Everybody in South Carolina knows you. <laughs> well, I, I or think there's I should, nobody. Okay. <laughs> I, 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 I hope I, I hope I should be flattered by that. <laughs> but uh, but I'm not as famous as the Murdochs. So <laughs> yeah, well, well, Jim, right, right, right. You're probably lucky, right? <laughs> yeah. So tell us, uh, tell us, sort of what position they occupied, if any in the uh, South Carolina legal hierarchy? I mean, look, they had, and you know, I mean, it's not their fault, right? I mean, I mean, and look, I'm not a a media basher. I understand that the media and press is a big part of democracy, you know, so I'm not, this is not a criticism of, of the press, but you know, it does sell a little better if you're couching all this, and that's fine, I'm also a capitalist, I get it, um, it does sell a little better if this is like this dynasty, you know, if this, this is this statewide dynasty that's, you know, that's, 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 you know, either falling or faltered or, you know, only time will tell. I mean, the reality of it was, in my experience, that, you know, they had a good little skit going in a very rural, insular part of South Carolina, all right? And, you know, at the time, you know, in South Carolina, if you got, if you slipped and fell in a in a Walmart in Greenville, or, you know, you had like a case in Greenville that well, a typically more conservative jury, and you had a Walmart down in Hampton, they don't have a Walmart in Hampton, which is part of my story, you could bring the lawsuit down there. All right. And so they had these, you know, juries that, you know, and, you know, if you're pro Murdoch, it would be, yeah, those juries loved them. But you hear the stories about how, you know, they bump into a Murdoch at a grocery store and they just say somebody had a car wreck and they would, you know, represent them for free. And, you know, that's one angle. The other angle is, you know, forever. Uh, Murdoch was the prosecutor down there. So, you know, and everybody knew everybody on the jury. And so you're like, you're on the jury and the Murdoch is, is, is this week he's, he's asking for money on a car wreck. And next week he might be deciding who to charge. Right. And so, you know, that all got a little uh, sort of convoluted. And, you know, I mean, you don't have to be a, like an ethics scholar to understand how that could get weird. Um, and then you just sort of couple that with the fact that, like, to my knowledge, there weren't any checks and balances down there. And, you know, so, you know, one of the things is like on the few occasions, I mean, I, I didn't go out seeking to be interviewed on this stuff. I, I was tr- I was really trying to keep my head down on it. I mean, it was just it just reached a fever pitch. I mean, almost to the point. That if you were being interviewed regularly about the Murdoch case, it was almost an indictment that you didn't have anything else to do. Right. I mean, you know what I mean? It was just really like it was really like, I mean, you know, you look at, you know, it's just kind of like, well, I mean, you know, I got work to do, man. You know, but, you know, and so, you know, there, there was just like, you know, uh, but on the couple of occasions that I got taught, I mean, it really did start to bother me a little bit that they were being portrayed as this, you know, they were like aristocratic family in South Carolina. They just weren't. I mean, they just weren't. Um, And, you know, they weren't a big deal anywhere outside of that insular area. Now, they made a lot of money. But, you know, the question becomes, you know, and I think it's a legitimate question. Did they make it because they were good lawyers? Did they make it because they worked real hard? Did they make it because they had the system rigged? I mean, you know, and those are the sort of questions that I think, you know, folks wonder. Um, but I mean, the one thing about the one of the many things about this case was, I mean, it I think it showed to me 
you know, I got interviewed by um, Sky TV in, in England, you know, and they were trying to make it like, oh, this is a Southern Gothic thing. I'm like, hey, look, man, you know, th this is what Renamede was about, right? This is what the Magna Carta was about, right? So this isn't a Southern thing. This is a human thing, right? And this is what happens when you when power gets transferred, not through democracy, it gets transferred through lineage and, you know, and there's no check and there's no balance. It's human nature that's going to go awry. All right. And, and, and you would have to be superhuman to be someone that there's no check and balance and you had a lot of power and, and you didn't, you know, abuse it because it would be easy and it's easy to make sense of it when there's no one checking it. So that's kind of my thoughts on Murdoch's. My my experience is that anytime a lawyer commits a crime, all of a sudden they're prominent. Well, right. Prominent oh, lawyer does this. Right. You've never oh, heard of the no guy. Fun. I mean, and it, actually, when you think about that, right? Because it's really like no fun picking on like, like if you're just like, oh, this guy's a sorry lawyer and he's, <laughs> you know, he's not, and he committed a crime. You're like, what's interesting about that? Yeah. Right? That happened in Robin, that Robin. happened in Georgia, uh, Robin, with uh, Fred Tokars. You know, Fred, yeah. nobody I knew had ever heard of Fred Tokars. Well, and, uh, you know, he he hires a hitman to kill his wife. Uh, in front that'll of get kid. you in the news. And then he's prominent. And same for Tex McIver, who shot his wife in their car. He was an employment lawyer, and they kicked him out of the firm. But now all of a sudden he's prominent. Uh, right. It just it right. it's it's a. It's, I, I will say that, like you know, I mean. I talked about that, and it really uh, surprised me. The number of people that reached out to me were just like, "Just thank you," you know, from South Carolina. Just thank you because, I mean, yeah, they were. I mean, I'm not going to say they were nobodies. I mean, they had a firm that had made a lot of money, and they had a niche, and you know, they'd done really well at it. But I mean, like, I don't know that they had any cases on the docket any place other than those other. I mean, I'm sure they have some, but I mean. It's not like they're like Motley Rice or anybody who's got like cases all over the country or, you know, that have really got like this sort of a bigger reach. I mean, their their world was. Those so, so one of the things I thought, um, you, you know, I enjoy tradecraft. You know, my, my, my trade is being a trial lawyer and I like watching other people do that. And um, I sort of felt like a lot of the elements of that case were, you know, it's the same elements that made Yellowstone uh, a hit. You know, you've got... Uh, I tried to like that show. I just... <laughs> you've got this dynasty, you know, right, that you, you right. can you know, dress all this up. But I was really more intrigued, I think, with the lawyers and, and what you were talking about it being runny me. And, you know, so much time now, you know, we hear, oh, the U.S. Supreme Court has done this and the Supreme Court's done that. And I doubt anybody's ever really persuaded uh, a Supreme Court justice uh, of something different than what view they had before they walked on the bench in the last 15 years, uh, at least. But this went back sort of to the roots of justice and, and uh, you know, in a, in a tiny little courthouse, you know, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm fond of saying that at one time we had uh, great towering trial lawyers in little wooden courthouses. And now we've got a bunch of little wooden lawyers in great towering courthouses. And this was oh, yeah. sort of a return, you know, to that. So I, I, I knew, uh, you know, Jim Griffith, he was on law review with me at the University of South Carolina, have known of and met Dick Harputland, you know, a time or two, did not really know anybody on the uh, uh, prosecution team. Uh, which was <laughs> kind of shocked me a little bit because I, I I felt like I knew a lot of lawyers, but I hadn't heard of them. But uh, what was what what can you tell us about them and about uh, about their game? I'll say as as trial lawyers in South yeah. Carolina. Hey, look, Dick and Jim. I mean, you know, full disclosure. I mean, they're friends of mine, right? So you know, um, but I mean, I think objectively they are. You know, I've always viewed them as as, you know, very, 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 very among the best, you know, an elite group of trial lawyers in in I mean, in South Carolina. And I mean, they're people who, you know, their skills I respect. Um, and they are they're 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 really good, right? Um and uh I don't know what to say about that. I mean, they're 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 good lawyers. Um, um and you know, I would 
I'd hire him, right? If I was in trouble, you know, um, if it couldn't get me. But anyway, but uh, but uh, because I wouldn't want to make a fool of myself, right? Represent myself. But yeah, no, they're they're and they're in the top. Um, and then you know, I mean, I think the other thing is, you know, Creighton Waters, who's a friend of mine, um, and you know, I mean, we're not. I'm not a. We're an acquaint. We know each other, and I respect him. Okay, I mean, he's not like. I mean, Dick and Jim and our most social and professional friends. Um, and Creighton is, you know, a guy who, uh, you know, he's a good prosecutor, right? I mean, I think he's he, nothing flamboyant. You don't, and prosecutors shouldn't be flamboyant. I mean, it's the facts. These are the facts. And, you know, I'm not saying he's dull or boring or anything, but I thought he did a good, solid job putting together a complicated case. I mean, I know there's been some disagreement, you know, between the defense and the prosecution about the quality of the investigation. I mean, you know, but that, you know, I mean, I think it's something that the jury needs to know all the time. I, and, and I hope that society doesn't think that because defense lawyers are pointing out deficiencies or perceived deficiencies in investigation that it's an indictment of the agency but I, but I just think that you know that a jury's got a right to know you know exactly how much weight to give to the government's case and the only way they can judge that is to have been provided sort of alternative theories or maybe things that could have been done better or things that could have been done differently. And so, I mean, this is all just a natural pro part of the criminal justice process. And, you know, I, 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 I wish folks would stop like maligning the defense, like they had the audacity to, 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 to really put the government's case to a test. That's what a trial is supposed to be, right? If whether it's civil or whether it's criminal, if if you know, my dad used to look, when I decided I was gonna be a trial lawyer, my dad was like, well, I don't know, son, you know what? Just trial lawyers, you know, and all this trial stuff. And I was like, you know, dad, like trials are actually pretty civilized. Cause if you think about what we did before trials, it was like all of your family got all their guns and all of that family got all their guns and they shot at each other, right? And so, you know, now we've got this fairly civilized forum where we bring conflict in. And, you know, I wish, you know, that every trial, you know, where someone's liberty was at stake, regardless of who they are, was, 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 um, was fault like that. I mean, I think that would be, you know, would produce better justice. Well, we know that um, Dick Harputlian, uh, who I don't know, but I, I would recognize he's, now, he's uh, he, he seems like a good guy. He seems like a real good trial lawyer. Um, but we know that in the, the social media that, that is so rampant about this trial that he, a lot of people criticized him. He He got hate mail. Um, just kind of vicious comments about him because he was representing what pretty much everyone agrees is is a disgusting defendant. I mean, it's hard to like Alec Murdoch. Well, now uh, everybody used to like him. Now, <laughs> yeah, now that we know, him. right, right, right. Um, I mean, isn't that more of an indictment of us than him in some ways? You think about it, right? <laughs> Maybe, but you know. So I, I was interested in in that aspect, especially since you. You you represent defendants also who, you know, um, not always on on the side of of right, but you have a constitutional, you know, defendants are innocent until proven guilty, have a constitutional right to make yeah, that's a, not a finger quote thing, right? I mean, we can all agree on that. I mean, people really should be innocent until absolutely, absolutely. So I was intrigued when I saw um Dick Carputlian's first speech back in the Senate. Well, when he, after this trial, now he's he's a state senator. He's back in the Senate and he, he gives a pretty lengthy speech. And I'd like to play just a little snippet of it because he go he really dives deep into that constitutional right and what it means uh, to have a lawyer to represent you when when your liberty is at stake. Um, so I'd like for us to listen to that, and then I'm going to ask for your comments about it 
uh, how you see this and and your take on it on the other side. I mean, I mean, my, my personal observations are that I've been doing this almost a half a century. And it's still, fun is the wrong word, but it's still as enjoyable today for me as it was almost 50 years ago when I began this process of trying cases. Um, and I've tried hundreds and hundreds of them, big cases, little cases. I've won cases. I've lost cases. But that process, if it operates correctly, can be so satisfying to the lawyers. Now, the client, if they lose, they're not satisfied. If they win, typically they feel like they should have won anyway. So it's really not. Um, it's, it's not particularly fun for them or satisfying for them. The second point I make is this, and, and the senator from Charleston has questions about the integrity of the system. Now, I disagree with Judge Newman on some of the rulings he made. We, he ruled. We objected. It's in the record. The court, uh, Supreme Court, Court of Appeals have a chance to look at it, and maybe even federal court. But that's not based on bias, or he just had a view of the law different than I had. Now... <laughs> The third thing I want to say is this. There are, and of course, unfortunately, um, people feel compelled to express their opinion on things through the Internet. Somehow they got a hold of my, I guess it's on my website, my email. I really wanted that big case you had, but that's not what they chose to send me. Um, most of it was very positive. A lot of it were people that were watching this in Germany or England or the Netherlands or, I mean, wacky. I don't know. They don't have anything else to do in those countries. But a, a, a bunch of people here also gave me suggestions on a daily basis what we should do or how we screwed up yesterday. But the folks that sent me the, you are a rotten piece of scum, and I hope you die of, let me clean this up a little bit, rectal cancer. Um, you know, what? they have a misapprehension of the system. They have a misapprehension of our justice system. While they're very familiar with the Second Amendment, they're not, they apparently haven't read the Fourth, the Fifth, the Sixth, or the Eighth Amendments that guarantee us the freedom, the freedom, or guarantee our freedoms of ourselves and our property. John Adams, the second president of the United States, in 1770, eight British soldiers were charged with murdering uh, colonial activists, uh, demonstrators, who charged them. Eight of them were indicted and charged with murder. John Adams represented them. 1770. Six were acquitted, two were convicted of manslaughter, none were, none were hung or, or whatever. Now, he said that everybody deserves the, the presumption of innocence and the benefit of counsel. Why? I don't understand this presumption of innocence and everybody's entitled to a lawyer. Is such an alien concept. Um, but trust me, there are literally hundreds, if not thousands, that we, me and my co-counsel, we got emails. Not all of them wish rectal cancer on me, but most of them are fairly critical. Um, and so those are people that don't understand the Constitution. They also understand one other thing. I took an oath 49 years ago. And I pull it out from time to time and read it as a lawyer because oaths matter. Your word matters. I will maintain the respect and courtesy due to the courts of justice, judicial officials, and those who assist them. To my clients, I pledge faithfulness, competence, diligence, good judgment, and prompt communications. To opposing parties and their counsel, I pledge fairness, integrity, civility, not only in court, but also in all written and oral communications. Now, I've not always upheld that particular oath promise there, but but God knows I've tried. Um, I will maintain the dignity of the legal system and advance no, prejudice, pre, no fact prejudicial to the honor and reputation of a party or witness unless required by the justice of the cause which I am charged. I will assist the defenseless or oppressed by ensuring that justice is available to all citizens and citizens will not delay any person's cause for profit or malice. So help me God. This is an oath I took 49 years ago, and I take it seriously. And by the way, my interest, you don't have to convince me you're innocent for me to represent you. That's not the issue. The issue is, can the state prove your guilt beyond a reasonable doubt? And once you decide that position, once you decide that position, you are free to do what is in your client's best interest. If your mind is muddled with, 
you know, is he innocent or guilty? You cannot do your job. And I've prosecuted. I've put a man in the electric chair. I've defended a man who went to the electric chair. I've done both sides. I'm not a Red Sox fan or a Yankees fan. This, that's not what this is about. This is doing your job. To so those who out there, this may appear on YouTube somewhere, who don't understand that, go read a book. You know, Abraham Lincoln represented 20 murder defendants. Not all of them were acquitted, but he fought for every one of them. This is about a system. And by the way, that system doesn't exist in this state without us. That's the attractiveness of being in this body. We shape how that system works. That's an impassioned speech, obviously. Uh, he thought ahead, brought the oath with him because he wanted to share it again. Uh, I thought it was a magnificent speech. Uh, but I, I saw on Twitter some people criticized him for that speech. Uh, what's your, what are your thoughts, Bill? <laughs> you know, I mean, that's the problem. I mean, I will say this, right? And Dick Harpole is a real good friend of mine. Jim Griffin is a real good friend of mine. But they made themselves part of the circus, okay? Um, and 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 that doesn't make it okay what people said, but it does give it does give people that don't understand a place to put their ignorance. All right. And so, so look, I mean, you know, I was a public defender for a while. My life, my wife's the chief public defender. A lot of my friends are public defenders. Um, and there are just people in this world that, you know, they see the world black and white. Okay. And there's no gray. All right. And, you know, the, the, you know, the, the only thing I take a little bit of disagreement with Dick is the worst thing is representing an innocent person. Okay. Like, I mean, I mean, that is, that is the worst, right? I mean, I agree with him in that. I mean, and that is impassive. And look, Dick, Dick, Dick believes all that. And Dick, you know, Dick is committed to being a lawyer and understands the vital part that that plays in a functioning democracy. OK, just like he understands the vital part has being a representative and the part of that pays in a functioning democracy. But it's not a black and white thing. And so, you know, I mean, I mean, people have always thought things like this. It's just that, like, before we had social media they had to scream at their TV and the only people that were inflicted on it uh, were, 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 you know, their family members that had to be like, listen to a dog laying on the floor. Yeah. Right, 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 right. right. So now every, not, like everybody always had an opinion, but now we've got to suffer through everybody's opinion. Right. I'm not on Twitter. I'm not on Facebook. I mean, I just really think that, you know, that, 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 you know, we can, you know, and so I just think we need to, that is, is, you know, I am sorry and it is wrong. And look, my wife's lawyers, when they defend people, you know, get the same thing. Okay. And, and, you know, um, it's, it's just, I mean, in some respects, it's kind of a sign you're doing your job, right? I mean, you know, I mean, your job isn't, I mean, when, you know, I've defended, and that brings back to me, but I mean, I know that feeling very well. I mean, I have sat in a courtroom in rural South Carolina next to the person that for, you know, two years leading up to it and until the next tragedy happens, is going to be the most hated person in that community, all right? But your job is to shepherd them through this process, you know? And my wife is always talking about feelings, chief public fears, like, what people don't understand is like your job is not to get them off. Your job is to get them a fair trial. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and, you know, look, Alec Murdoch, you know, because, you know, I mean, I think that there was some wind behind him going into that. Right now it was stripped away by all this fraud and stealing that he did. 
And he had a well-financed criminal defense team, right? They were well-financed, right? They could get any expert they wanted, which is the way it should be. But like, you know, the Dick's job was to shepherd that person through the criminal justice system and to just get him a fair trial. And that's all his job was. And that's what he did. He did to the best of his ability. And I think a great job. I think they did a great job um, to, to get him a fair trial. Now, as he mentioned, I mean, you know, there were decisions, you know, that the judge made that they disagreed with, right? I mean, they hate each other. They just disagree, right? And, you know, that's how we settle conflict in this country. And it's, you know, it's the envy of the world. It really is. And it ain't perfect. And, you know, we should always be trying to make it better. And we should always be, you know, trying to root out injustice in our justice system. And and I recognize that's a that's a, a moving target, right? I mean, you know, I mean, fortunately, things that we used to think were fine, we don't think are fine anymore as a society. And that's, you know, that's how a society evolves, becomes better. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Dick, Dick did his job. And, you know, he, you know, he did his job. I, I think uh, Murdoch would have a hard claim to make of ineffective assistance. Right, right, right. I don't think that's I, a no, I mean, I think they're best. I mean, I think I think their best, you know, his best shot is, you know, I mean, look, that was a lot of stuff that didn't have anything to do with murder that came in. You know what I mean? And, you know, I mean, I, reasonable minds can disagree on that. But, I mean, I think that you know, was a lot. Of, I mean, they spent a lot of time talking about stuff that didn't have anything to do with killing anybody. Um, yep. And, you know, that's going to be fertile ground for appeal. You know? Yeah, I mean, look, and Judge Newman is a really good judge. He's a really smart guy. And I'm not saying that just because he's a judge. Okay, uh, I would have adopted. <laughs> I would have adopted my mom's analogy, which you can't say anything nice, just don't say anything at all. If 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 it was otherwise, but he's a good. He's a smart guy, and you know, I think that you know, that's going to be interesting is to see how that piece of the trial um, shakes out. One of the one of the things that's happened here in Georgia recently, two two of the most more, more recent high profile murder cases. What Robin's already alluded to one, and I think was involved in some aspect of the civil part of that, uh, is the Tex MacIver case, where he's coming back from uh, his his farm. Some somebody in the trial said, "Well, Tex called it a ranch. I call it a farm, but it was out, <laughs> you know, between Atlanta and the South Carolina line, and he." Uh, they shouldn't even call it a plantation, right? Right, right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right, right. He, he, shot, he shot his wife in the back, claimed he got his pistol out because of uh, the, he was afraid of Black Lives Right or Black Lives Matter Right in right, right. Right. Atlanta. And uh, so that case got reversed on failure to include, on a lesser included offense of, I think it was uh, involuntary manslaughter. Involuntary, yeah. And, uh, but the Supreme Court also gave a lot of direction about other motives that had been in that trial. For example, uh, there was supposedly a second will that nobody had. They didn't have the will. And, you know, the Supreme Court said that's highly prejudicial. Had another case, the Ross Harris case, where the guy leaves his infant child in a hot car and the child dies. And the prosecutors put in the fact that um, he apparently had multiple online sexual dalliances uh, going on <laughs> and whatnot. And it was reversed because it was said to be prejudicial, right. that the prejudice outweighed the probative value. And one of the things that I, I don't, I, I'm going to ask you ultimately, what do you think happens with that in South Carolina? You know, one of the things that struck me in the, the Murdoch trial is, okay, so the guy stole money from his clients and he stole money from his law partners, stealing money from the clients. You know, there's a special ring of hell uh, for lawyers who do that in my book. And so I could sort of kind of go along with, well, that may have been that may have played a role in this in some way. But the level of detail that they got into that the judge allowed them to go into, like, you know, you, you, you know, you cheated, you cheated a guy who's you know, on a respirator and you cheated, you, you know, you, you went and met with this guy and you looked him in the eye 
And they let all of that, and you lied to him, and they let all of that in on the financial crimes under the guise of credibility. And to me, that seemed like that was, at least in the detail, was more character evidence. But I don't know what the South Carolina uh, appellate courts have held on that before. So what what do you think the chances are of a reversal? I mean, I mean, I mean, I, I'm not going to handicap it, but I mean, I think I think it's fertile ground for an, for a discussion, right? Um, I mean, I think you know, I mean, the problem is this, right? The problem is the precedential value of just saying no, all that's fine, okay? And and you know, so I mean, that becomes like basically just making it fairly like wild character movie. assassination right 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 and so you know i mean i mean i mean i can hear one thing i thought was kind of so my wife and i were talking about this Billy and i were talking about this and look i'm not criticizing the job anybody did right but just a thought right it seems to me that if the, the prosecution had been this okay if they had been able to wrap their mind around the fact that, I mean, then those of us who have defended people and, you know, just had a little bit more of a rich life understand that people sometimes kill people not just because they hate them. And if the theory had been for the prosecution, and I don't know whether the guy did or not, I wasn't there, all right, but, but <laughs> if the theory had been he killed them because he knew the son was getting ready to go to jail and it was a hor- going to be a horrible, horrible, horrible thing. And because he had just gotten pulled in and like it looked like things were starting to go bad on his finances, that he was probably going to go to prison and w- they were going to be broke. And his wife was going to be, you know, like within the near horizon, you know, her son was going to be in state prison her husband was going to be in federal prison and they were going to be broke. And, you know, he did it because he didn't want to see them go through all that shame because that's one of the things we do know in the South, like just this, this shame is a, is a horrible, you know, and like there's been a lot, you know, and that the crime was committed to keep them from having to go through that shame. I think there would have been a little bit better nexus between both the boat crash and the financial crimes. But I mean, I think that, I always, you know, I think that there's, and I'm not judging the judge, I'm not judging anybody, but I mean, I, I do think there's a there's a fertile conversation to be had about, first of all, was there really a nexus between, under the theory that the government went forward on, which was, he did this, I'm not really sure why, I mean, I, I he did it to keep because it wasn't like they had the information and they were getting ready to come forward and dis, and and disclose. So I mean, so I think there there's probably some fertile discussion about whether there was a close enough nexus between the murders and the financial crimes, right? And then once you get past that, you know, like it's almost like uncle, right? I mean, how much more can you can you bring in? And, you know, it's like in, I mean, the best analogy I can give is in capital cases that I've done, when you have victim impact evidence, right? You know, there is sometimes it's like, okay, that's just too much. I mean, the, the president, the, the, the probative value has outweighed the, um, the pre- the prejudicial value is it, it's outweighed more the prejudice. It's more. I, I'm dyslexic. All right, so I get that backwards. But 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 the, but the prejudice is greater than the probative value. But and, but victim victim impact statements come after a, a conviction. Right, but that goes to whether they're going to get killed or not. Right. So, <laughs> yeah. So and that's usually usually that's the part you're really fighting over, right? Sure. Um, right. I mean, because capital cases shouldn't be a who done it, right? Um, but um, no, so, I, mean, right. I, I, I don't think those are two issues that I think are going to be. And I think there was another issue about a Doyle issue when they asked him about this. is. The Why didn't you that. come forward? Why didn't you come forward and uh, tell us uh, uh, right. Uh, right about this sooner? You know, 
about being yeah, there. Really, yeah, and you know, a lot of that has to do with when your right to counsel is attached and all that. And and to be candid with you, I, I, I mean, and that gets fairly in the weeds about the timing, all that. And to be candid with you, I, I didn't follow it close enough to know exactly. But I mean, those are issues that you know I think are legitimate issues for you. And you know, to be fair, it's really hard being a judge. And you know, these are decisions that. You know, that should be that, that there's a reason we make these decisions, you know, with a little bit of time and, you know, like it's a little bit, you know, less, a little bit more dispassionate. So uh, we were talking the other day when I invited you to be on and talk about this. And we were talking about one of mine, Robin's favorite authors, Pat Conroy, who you were telling us is the godfather to your children. And uh, I'm well, you know what? One of them is is Pat Conroy, and the other one is John Delgado. Who? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. 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 I, I, I know, know John as well. I remember John coming and speaking to us when we were in law school, and yeah. just great passion for 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 being a criminal defense passionate lawyer. man, very passionate. Uh, but and I I expect, to segue from uh, from Murdoch into into uh, some of the other stuff that we wanted to talk about. How, how, would, how do you think Pat Conroy, the late, great Pan, Pat Conroy, would have written about the Murdoch trial? What would well, he yeah, have thought? Yeah, that's what I think is, is sort of interesting. And I, you know, I've got friends of mine, who, and one in particular, who's like, you know, I wanted to write about it. The cool thing about Pat would, would have been this, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm reading, um, I'm reading, um, um, Look, I'm an angel now, right? And because uh, I've started it like four times, but I'm going to finish it this time. Um, and you know, is it the the beauty of Pat would have been like he would have taken that as fantastic as that story is, and he would have taken that, and it would have been the kernel for something just you know even bigger than that, right? Because he would have t- you know what they say about. You know, it's not that Southern writers are that creative. They're just good reporters, you know, and, and and so and so, you know, so, I mean, he would have taken that really great story and not just chronicled it. Right. Like a Dateline or, you know, Netflix or and all of those have been very well done and I applaud him. But he would have taken that and used it as the launching, in my opinion, he would have used it as the launching pad for his amazing creativity and he would have had a a, a a way of weaving in other stories and would have developed them into you know people that he um yeah so uh do you have a favorite pat conroy book you know what's interesting is i can tell you that my first exposure to pat conroy was my mom used to let me stay up and watch we were like Remember back in the days when, like, TV, oh, I'm just going to date myself, right? Remember, like, if you stayed up late enough, they played a national anthem and have, like, little American well, Snow comes on. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so my mom, <laughs> I guess when I was about, we were still in Sumter, but she let me stay up and watch the late, late movie, you know? And I remember um, The Water is Wide came on. Uh, with John Voight, who was like the anti Pat Conroy once he kind of grew up, right? In my understanding, she's not, you know, but, but, um, and I remember watching that and it really, 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 really impacted me, you know? And, and, and so, you know, I remember my, my dad, like, oh, you know, boy, went to the Senate, I was a little bit of a troublemaker down there, you know, my dad was, but, um, and so then, when I was at the Citadel, The Lords of Discipline came out. And, you know, that was a book that I started reading that book when I was a not. And it had such a, I mean, it was almost like post-traumatic stress disorder, right? I mean, I was, it was, <laughs> you know, and I put it aside and then finished it that summer. But, you know, it, Pat Conroy and like Willie Morris, you know, I mean, th- those of us that were, and you know, Lester, I got to, you know, like, you know, we are, we're Southerners. I mean, we're very much Southerners, but you know, we, uh, and I think the drive by truckers call it a duality of the South. Right. I mean, you know, it's like, you know, we love people and that are in our family that we, 
philosophically and like our family doesn't know where it came from. My dad, I mean, the fact that I was a public defender and my dad just couldn't wrap his mind around that, right? But, 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 you know, and there's that group of us, you know, that, that it's not just men, but like that, that passionately love this region, okay? Even with its warts, you know, and even with, you know, the, the bitter Southerner syndrome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and, and it's the duality in the South, you know, and, and I will tell you that my one boy, Ella, uh, I got twin boys. So I'm just I've got five children. And um, 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 but, you know, I mean, I've got this picture of my son, Alec, when he was about 10, sitting on a, a rail with Pat Conroy's brother, um, Tim Conroy. Um, who was explained? They were watching the drive-by truckers, and he was explaining to Ellick just that whole duality of South thing, right? And I'm not sure anybody's ever really done it, you know. But but we all know, you know. It's it's. Uh, I, mean, I love the South, you know. I mean, I just love the, the, the duality of the South. I don't know, Robin, if you've heard that that song, you know, the drive-by truckers, but it talks about the three. They call it the three great Alabamans, Alabamians, you know, who is, who is uh, Ronnie Van Zant, uh, uh, George Wallace, and Bear Bryant. Right. And uh, it uh, talks about what you know. One of the things it talks about is, uh, you know, in the song uh, "Sweet Home Alabama," uh, that uh it, it's it's sort of uh he says mr i hope mr young will remember the southern man doesn't need him around anyhow he's actually pretty good friends with neil right right, right. And, Honorary and, and sort of appreciated right. uh yeah. um uh, uh, appreciated neil young's views you know on on some of that so you to bring that back to pat for just a second pat right. you're still so stupid that, like he said one time when, you know, when we, we had the Confederate flag on top of the state house, and Pat was very involved in, you know, getting that taken down. And he tells a story about how he says, like, so he was like, um, he was on TV. I mean, I don't know whether he was interviewed or just, you know, but it was fairly prominent. He was involved. He says, I came home and I get this phone voice message, you know, about whenever you had answer machines. And it was a, a family member. His goes, hey, you little grubby commie. You know, I saw you on there like blah, 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 bad math. And then he says, with apologies, he says, love you. Can't wait to see you at Thanksgiving. You know, it just felt like, you know, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So now we come to the culmination of our show, I think, mm -hmm. today, which is where we put everybody on the spot, although we do give you advance notice, right? and ask their definition of justice. And I, I, I'll tell you, uh, you know, with a lot of guests, I, I, I think I know what they're going to say, but I have no idea what the great Bill Nettles may <laughs> well, say. I don't, know about, yeah. I don't know. Well, you have to go get the great Bill Nettles, but this is the Bill <laughs> Nettles you got for right now, okay? Um, you know, I'm glad y'all kind of gave me a heads up on that because, I mean, that's, you know, that's kind of, you know, something that, hell, we, we don't really think about it much. And I did. I, I had to be in the car a good bit for the last two days. I, I had two different things in Charleston. So I spent, you know, probably six, eight hours on I-26 over the last two days. And you know what I think? I mean, I mean, first of all, I think I was trying to think about that. And I started thinking about if you define justice, well, first of all, you got this whole notion that one of the things that always made me crazy and still does the criminal justice, it doesn't make me crazy because I don't want to, I mean, I just find it disingenuous. It's when a prosecutor or a defense lawyer says, you know, Bill, that's fair, All right? Like, don't tell me what's fair, right? I mean, you know, it just really annoys me when anybody on the other side says, this is fair, right? Because the problem with that is fairness is a matter of perspective, right? So I really ran that around in my head a couple of times. I just, and then, and then you got the whole notion that like, what's fair today? And like what we think of, what they thought of it was fair in the 60s, 70s, even 80s, we don't find that fair anymore. And so you've got this whole notion of that fair is, is evolving, fortunately, right? So I decided that probably the better way, since this is this is something I'm having to say that's being recorded and just 
in over a, a drink that I could just deny it all is um is um that I believe fairness is the absence of injustice. That justice is what happens if you take out all injustice. And that's what you're left with. And so um I mean, I appreciate the heads up because I couldn't come up with that. But, but, but I don't mind telling you. I, that's, I mean, a, that's, a, that's a great definition. You know, uh, I, I have clients, too, that you know tell me something's not fair. And I, I remind them that fair is a place where a pig gets a blue ribbon. You know? <laughs> right, right, <laughs> right, 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 um, right, right, right. But, uh, but that's great. Uh, we've really, really uh, enjoyed having you on uh, today uh, with us, Bill. Um, and... Uh, uh, we've been talking with former United States attorney for the only district of South Carolina, uh, trial lawyer Bill Nettles. You can read more about Bill on his firm's website, BillNettlesLaw.com, and you can follow him on Twitter. I thought you said you weren't on Twitter, Bill. Hey, you know, all right. Okay, let me tell you something. Wait a minute. I did a thing on Dateline that I'm very proud of, where they did a, they did a, it's called Crossroads. If you Google that, Dateline Crossroads, it's about this program we did on community level law enforcement, right? And so they said, when it was getting ready to air, I remember like the families on TV and they're like, you got to get a Twitter because we're going to, we're going to want you to like comment. And I was like, so I opened up a Twitter account and then it just scared me to death, right? It's the reason I don't have guns in the house, right? Because like, like, like if you say something on Twitter or you think something, I don't want everybody knowing everything I'm thinking all the time, okay? Because like it's not always good, right? And so I'm just I I, I stay away from that. Like, yes, I've got one, but I, I don't think I've posted anything in like five years because it literally like like I've you know, I've surfed big waves, I've mountain bike rid, I've done stuff you have to wear a helmet. Twitter scares me to death. Okay. So I just stay away from it. Yeah. So don't follow Bill at no, Bill. No, no, you can love Bill. Like, if Twitter anybody's Twitter. written anything, it's not me. I'll just tell you that. Oh, that's great. Well, thanks, Bill. It's been a pleasure well, having you. you on the show. I appreciate it. Thank you. Well, Lester, uh, it's come the time in our program that we always like to uh, highlight some legal-related news item that we've seen. And mine has to deal with a lawsuit out in California, a uh, civil lawsuit against a defendant called Do Not Pay, which is Do Not Pay is a robot lawyer. And it's a website where this website, Do Not Pay, claims you can get every legal document you need. You don't need a lawyer. Just go to our website, get the documents, and file them, and you'll be great. And apparently, that that's not true, that it, you will not be able to just file the documents they provide on the website and win your case. And one man who tried to do that with those legal documents uh, found out it doesn't quite work work like that and everything was substandard and he didn't get his money's worth and ended up having to hire a lawyer anyway and they they especially claimed that their um, documents regarding defamation demand letters creating a power of attorney or sue anyone in small claims court would all you ne need to do to, <laughs> to win your to win your lawsuit so this plaintiff has hired a real lawyer uh, a human lawyer to sue the company for the unauthorized practice of law in California, um, which is pretty interesting. So I shared that article with uh, our friends, Paula Frederick and Jenny Middleman, who are general counsel. Paula is the general counsel of the state bar of Georgia, and Jenny is her associate or assistant counsel. And Jenny said, you know, just for fun, I, I uh, put in to that chat GPT. Everybody's talking about chat GPT, artificial intelligence. She said, I, I asked chat GPT, can a robot give legal advice? And this is what chat GPTs, the artificial intelligence um, model responded. As an AI language model, I can, I can provide general information, but I am not a licensed attorney and cannot provide legal advice. However, as for the question of whether a robot can give legal advice, it is unlikely that a robot could give legal advice in the same way a human lawyer could. 
While it is true that artificial intelligence and machine learning algorithms are increasingly being used in the legal field to help with tasks such as document review and legal research, the practice of law involves more than just data analysis. From providing legal advice requires a deep understanding of the law, legal precedent, and the specific circumstances of a case. It also requires an ability to apply legal principles to real-world situations and to communicate effectively with clients. Therefore, while robots and AI may be able to assist lawyers in certain tasks, they are unlikely to be able to provide legal advice in the same way that a human lawyer could. Any legal advice given by a robot would need to be reviewed and approved by a licensed attorney, and even then, it would likely be limited to relatively simple legal matters. So <laughs> <That's right. laughs> the good news is we're not going to be put out of business, Lester, by robots or artificial intelligence. There are just so many gems there, Robin. Like when Do Not Pay got sued, they didn't hire Do Not Pay. <laughs> they got a real <laughs> lawyer. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, you know, and also I've always felt like these uh, online, you know, type uh, uh, things, uh, that are going to replace lawyers. You know, people ask me, like, were you worried about that? And I'm like, nope, it's going to create a more problems. They're going to end up paying me more uh, in the end to straighten out their problems because they've, uh, you know, really, really right. dug in deep. And right. I, I'm finally reminded of uh, the old saying that uh, a lawyer has himself for a client, represents himself as a fool for a client. And clearly, uh, that robot is nobody's fool <laughs> there. You know, not not giving the not giving the advice. What you got, Lester? I have I have nothing. I'm I'm, I'm on the cutting edge here uh, today because I'm going to talk about an article that's going to appear in today or tomorrow's paper uh, uh, because it's been ex something that's been extensively uh, covered. Uh, in the press, but uh, th there was a judicial, Georgia's Judicial Qualifications Commission, which uh, has uh, uh, ethical jurisdiction for judges in the state of Georgia, um, and which I served on from a time and before a time in a previous incarnation. It's had a case against a court of appeals judge, Judge Christian Coomer, and uh, Judge Coomer was previously. Uh, uh, practicing law here in Cartersville, Georgia. He was in the state legislature. And uh, th that you, you may want to look up or not look up about what that trial was about. I know a lot of people followed it, though not as many as the followed the Murdoch trial. Mm -hmm. uh, but yesterday there was a really and truly uh, earth shifting uh, opinion from the Georgia Supreme Court the Judicial Qualifications Commission had recommended that Judge Coomer be removed from the bench, which would have been the first time that a sitting appellate court judge had ever been removed by the Judicial Qualifications Commission. And that was the recommendation that he be removed from the JQC hearing panel. The Supreme Court reversed it. And that's that reversal that I want to talk about for just a moment. Uh, and, and by the way, too, our friend Dennis Cathy represented Judge Coomer, and I think he's scheduled to be our next uh, podcast wow. guest, too. Yeah, so we can, I'm looking forward to it. We can talk it. about this more. But mm -hmm. when the JQC, when the legislature, uh, uh, they, call, they, tra they called it reconstituted. Uh, I have some other words for it. I was not a, not a fan of it. But uh, when they put together the Judicial Qualifications Commission, this new commission, took a, a sweeping view of its powers. And as you know, I represent a lot of judges and they asserted jurisdiction pretty much from cradle to grave. Anything a judge has ever done in their life uh, can uh, be used to remove them from the bench. And uh, I've argued against that. You know, I don't think if you, you know, were in detention when you were in the 12th grade, that, that would <laughs> impact you, you know, being a judge. Uh, but nor do I think a, a lot of other things, but most of these, in fairness, too, were things that lawyers had done while in private practice that then became a judge. And so the Supreme Court has said the Judicial Qualifications Commission no longer has conduct over any prejudicial service issues. And I was not particularly surprised by that ruling, frankly, because I, I thought it 
expanded the jurisdiction a little bit beyond what the intent uh, was for that. Uh, but I was sort of astounded at when it came because there were no less than four opportunities, at least three of which I was personally involved in, where we gave the Georgia Supreme Court the opportunity to say that before. But yet all these investigations continue. And then finally, you know, we get the answer at the end and it's, you know, they're telling the JQC, go back. And there's some other issues that need to uh, need to be uh uh, ruled on uh, before they can they can enter a final uh, a final opinion, but it was in the world of uh, jurisprudence in Georgia. I think sort of an earth shaking opinion, and I urge people to read about it. Uh, yeah. In the the, I'm sure the Atlanta Journal Constitution will have a piece up, uh, as well as uh, numerous other radio and TV uh, outlets uh, throughout. So that's mine for today. Ahead of the news, no article to read, but some yeah. news nonetheless. Well, I just pulled it up. Also, the opinion for our listeners um, can go to gasupreme.us and then hit Supreme Court Opinions. Uh, click on that and it, it comes right up and it's a 63 page per curiam opinion. So 63 pages by the Georgia Supreme Court. That That's a big deal in and of itself. It's a little. I, you say that that they've had several opportunities to make this ruling, but it but it finally took this one to get there. And I'm wondering, did it take a member of the appellate bench to be under scrutiny before they took this opportunity to, to make this ruling? You know, one of their own, so to speak. So very interesting yeah, to me. It's, uh, um, uh, you know, one of the other cases that I have is uh, not exclusively, but certainly the majority of the stuff that this judge has been accused of that I'm defending involves prejudicial conduct. And, uh, you know, there's been all kinds of resources uh, at the JQC used to try to uh, investigate and use those. And then, you know, I had a hearing tomorrow in that case. And, you know, we postponed the hearing because the whole platform upon which everything was built, you know, has now, has now it's gone. Gone. <laughs> gone. It, it's gone. And it's interesting well, to me, you know, we hear about that with regard to like Roe v. Wade being overturned or numerous other cases that I could say, you know, where what you thought was the law, you know, there's a new opinion from a court and it's no yeah. longer the law. Um, and th this one, I admit, it's a little inside baseball, but I think it's really important because it affects the judges that sit on our benches throughout the state of Georgia. It absolutely extremely important opinion from the Georgia Supreme Court. Well, that does it for us today. Today, I want to thank our sponsor, the Georgia Civil Justice Foundation, and you can learn more about the foundation at fairplay.org. Fred Smith is, is the executive director of the Georgia Civil Justice Foundation. We also want to thank our producer, Philip Hoover, and we thank our listeners for, for tuning in and following us. You more, learn more about our host, Lester Tate, at akintate.com, and more about me, Robin Fraser-Clark, at gatriallawyers.net. You can learn more about our podcast at cuincourt.squarespace.com. We hope you'll subscribe to the podcast and share it with your friends and family. You can find See You in Court on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, and anywhere you get your podcast. And we also ask that you rate the podcast. We thank you for listening. And Lester, until next time, we'll, we'll see, you, see in you in court. Thank you for listening to See You in Court, brought to you by the Georgia Civil Justice Foundation and the Georgia Institute of Technology. Please subscribe to this podcast and consider writing a review. You may find related documents to this week's episode on our website, cuincourt.podbean.com. Please send any questions, suggestions, or ideas to See you in court podcast at gmail.com. We thank Noreen Hassan, Associate Professor and Director of Outreach and Community Engagement of the Georgia Institute of Technology School of Literature, Media, and Communication, and the Georgia Tech students who help bring you this podcast. I'm Fred Smith, Executive Director of the Georgia Civil Justice Foundation. 